This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, December 7, 1906, Chapters from My Autobiography by Mark Twain. Chapter 7 I was always heedless. I was born heedless and therefore I was constantly and quite unconsciously committing breaches of the minor proprieties which brought upon me humiliations which ought to have humiliated me but didn't, because I didn't know anything had happened. But Livy knew, and so the humiliations fell to her share, poor child, who had not earned them and did not deserve them. She always said I was the most difficult child she had. She was very sensitive about me. It distressed her to see me do heedless things, which could bring me under criticism, and so she was always watchful and alert to protect me from the kind of transgressions which I have been speaking of. When I was leaving Hartford for Washington, upon the occasion referred to, she said, "'I have written a small warning and put it in a pocket of your dress-vest. When you are dressing to go to the author's reception at the White House, you will naturally put your fingers in your vest-pockets, according to your custom and you will find that little note there. Read it carefully and do as it tells you. I cannot be with you, and so I delegate my sentry duties to this little note. If I should give you the warning by word of mouth now, it would pass from your head and be forgotten in a few minutes." It was President Cleveland's first term. I had never seen his wife, the young, the beautiful, the good-natured, the sympathetic, the fascinating. Sure enough, just as I had finished dressing to go to the White House, I found that little note, which I had long ago forgotten. It was a grave little note, a serious little note, like its writer, but it made me laugh. Livy's gentle gravities often produced that effect upon me, where the expert humorist's best joke would have failed, for I do not laugh easily. When we reached the White House, and I was shaking hands with the President, he started to say something, but I interrupted him and said, if your excellency will excuse me, I will come back in a moment, but now I have a very important matter to attend to, and it must be attended to at once. I turned to Mrs. Cleveland, the young, the beautiful, the fascinating, and gave her my card, on the back of which I had written, He didn't, and I asked her to sign her name below those words. She said, He didn't? He didn't what? Oh, I said, never mind. We cannot stop to discuss that now. This is urgent. Won't you please sign your name?" I handed her a fountain pen. Why, she said, I cannot commit myself in that way. Who is it that didn't? And what is it that he didn't? Oh, I said, time is flying, flying, flying. Won't you take me out of my distress and sign your name to it? It's all right. I give you my word it's all right. She looked nonplussed, but hesitatingly and mechanically she took the pen and said, I will sign it. I will take the risk, but you must tell me all about it right afterwards, so that you can be arrested before you get out of the house in case there should be anything criminal about this." Then she signed, and I handed her Mrs. Clemens' note, which was very brief, very simple, and to the point. It said, "'Don't wear your arctics in the White House.' It made her shout, and at my request she summoned a messenger, and we sent that card at once to the mail on its way to Mrs. Clemens in Hartford. When the little Ruth was about a year or a year and a half old, Mason, an old and valued friend of mine, was Consul General at Frankfurt on the Main. I had known him well in 1867, 68, and 69 in America, and I and mine had spent a good deal of time with him and his family in Frankfurt in 78. He was a thoroughly competent, diligent, and conscientious official. Indeed, he possessed these qualities in so large a degree that among American consuls he might fairly be said to be monumental, for at that time our consular service was largely, and I think I may say mainly, in the hands of ignorant, vulgar, and incapable men who had been political healers in America, and had been taken care of by transference to consulates, where they could be supported at the government's expense instead of being transferred to the poor house, which would have been cheaper and more patriotic. Mason, in seventy-eight, had been consul-general in Frankfurt for several years, four, I think. He had come from Marseilles with a great record. He had been consul there during thirteen years, and one part of his record was heroic. There had been a desolating cholera epidemic, and Mason was the only representative of any foreign country who stayed at his post and saw it through. And during that time he not only represented his own country, 
but he represented all the other countries in Christendom, and did their work, and did it well, and was praised for it by them, in words of no uncertain sound. This great record of Mason's had saved him from official decapitation straight along while Republican presidents occupied the chair, but now it was occupied by a Democrat. Mr. Cleveland was not seated in it. He was not yet inaugurated. Before he was deluged with applications from Democratic politicians desiring the appointment of a thousand or so politically useful Democrats to Mason's place. A year or two later Mason wrote me and asked if I couldn't do something to save him from destruction. I was very anxious to keep him in his place, but at first I could not think of any way to help him, for I was a mugwump. We, the Mugwumps, a little company made up of the unenslaved of both parties, the very best men to be found in the two great parties, that was our idea of it, voted sixty thousand strong for Mr. Cleveland in New York, and elected him. Our principles were high and very definite. We were not a party, we had no candidates, we had no axes to grind. Our vote laid upon the man we cast it for, no obligation of any kind. By our rule we could not ask for office, we could not accept office. When voting it was our duty to vote for the best man, regardless of his party name. We had no other creed. Vote for the best man, that was creed enough. Such being my situation, I was puzzled to know how to try to help Mason, and at the same time save my mugwump purity undefiled. It was a delicate place. But presently, out of the ruck of confusions in my mind, rose a sane thought, clear and bright, to wit, since it was a mugwump's duty to do his best to put the best man in office, necessarily it must be a mugwump's duty to try to keep the best man in when he was already there. My course was easy now. It might not be quite delicate for a mugwump to approach the President directly, but I could approach him indirectly, with all delicacy, since in that case not even courtesy would require him to take notice of an application which no one could prove had ever reached him. Yes, it was easy and simple sailing now. I could lay the matter before Ruth, in her cradle, and wait for results. I wrote to the little child, and said to her all that I have just been saying about mugwump principles and the limitations which they put upon me. I explained that it would not be proper for me to apply to her father in Mr. Mason's behalf, but I detailed to her Mr. Mason's high and honorable record, and suggested that she take the matter in her own hands and do a patriotic work which I felt some delicacy about venturing upon myself. I asked her to forget that her father was only President of the United States, and her subject and servant. I asked her not to put her application in the form of a command, but to modify it, and give it the fictitious and pleasanter form of a mere request, that it would be no harm to let him gratify himself with the superstition that he was independent and could do as he pleased in the matter. I begged her to put stress, and plenty of it, upon the proposition that to keep Mason in his place would be a benefaction to the nation, to enlarge upon that and keep still about all other considerations. In due time I received a letter from the President, written with his own hand, signed by his own hand, acknowledging Ruth's intervention, and thanking me for enabling him to save to the country the services of so good and well-tried a servant as Mason and thanking me also for the detailed fullness of Mason's record, which could leave no doubt in any one's mind that Mason was in his right place and ought to be kept there. Mason has remained in the service ever since, and is now a consul general at Paris. During the time that we were living in Buffalo, in seventy seventy one, Mr. Cleveland was sheriff, but I never happened to make his acquaintance or even see him. In fact, I suppose I was not even aware of his existence. Fourteen years later he was become the greatest man in the state. I was not living in the state at the time. He was governor, and was about to step into the post of President of the United States. At that time I was on the public highway in company with another bandit, George W. Cable. We were robbing the public with readings from our works during four months, and in the course of time we went to Albany to levy tribute, and said, We ought to go and pay our respects to the governor. So Cable and I went to that majestic Capitol building and stated our errand. We were shown into the Governor's private office, and I saw Mr. Cleveland for the first time. We three stood chatting together. I was born lazy, and I comforted myself by turning the corner of a table into a sort of seat. Presently the Governor said, Mr. Clemens, 
I was a fellow citizen of yours in Buffalo a good many months, a good while ago, and during those months you burst suddenly into a mighty fame, out of a previous long continued and no doubt proper obscurity. But I was a nobody, and you wouldn't notice me nor anything to do with me. But now that I have become somebody, you have changed your style, and you come here to shake hands with me and be sociable. How do you explain this kind of conduct?" Oh, I said. It is very simple, Your Excellency. In Buffalo you were nothing but a sheriff. I was in society. I couldn't afford to associate with sheriffs. But you are a governor now, and you are on your way to the presidency. It is a great difference, and it makes you worth while. There appeared to be about sixteen doors to that spacious room. From each door a young man now emerged, and the sixteen lined up and moved forward and stood in front of the governor with an aspect of respectful expectancy in their attitude. No one spoke for a moment. Then the governor said, "'You are dismissed, gentlemen. Your services are not required. Mr. Clemens is sitting on the bells.' There was a cluster of sixteen bell-buttons on the corner of the table. My proportions at that end of me were just right to enable me to cover the whole of that nest, and that is how I came to hatch out those sixteen clerks. In accordance with the suggestion made in Gilder's letter recently received, I have written the following note to ex-President Cleveland upon his sixty-ninth birthday. Honored sir, your patriotic virtues have won for you the homage of half the nation and the enmity of the other half. This places your character as a citizen upon a summit as high as Washington's. The verdict is unanimous and unassailable. The votes of both sides are necessary in cases like these and the votes of the one side are quite as valuable as are the votes of the other. Where the votes are all in a man's favor, the verdict is against him. It is sand, and history will wash it away. But the verdict for you is rock, and will stand. S. L. Clemens As of date March 18, 1906 In a diary which Mrs. Clemens kept for a little while, a great many years ago, I find various mentions of Mrs. Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was a near neighbor of ours in Hartford, with no fences between. And in those days she made as much use of our grounds as of her own in pleasant weather. Her mind had decayed, and she was a pathetic figure. She wandered about all the day long in the care of a muscular Irish woman. Among the colonists of our neighborhood the doors always stood open in pleasant weather. Mrs. Stowe entered them at her own free will and as she was always softly slippered and generally full of animal spirits, she was able to deal in surprises, and she liked to do it. She would slip up behind a person who was deep in dreams and musings, and fetch a war-whoop that would jump that person out of his clothes. And she had other moods. Sometimes we would hear gentle music in the drawing-room, and would find her there at the piano, singing ancient and melancholy songs, with infinitely touching effect. Her husband, old Professor Stowe, was a picturesque figure. He wore a broad slouch hat. He was a large man and solemn. His beard was white and thick, and hung far down on his breast. The first time our little Susie ever saw him she encountered him on the street near our house, and came flying wide-eyed to her mother, and said, "'Santa Claus has got loose!' Which reminds me of Rev. Charlie Stowe's little boy, a little boy of seven years. I met Rev. Charlie crossing his mother's grounds one morning, and he told me this little tale. He had been out to Chicago to attend a convention of congressional clergymen, and had taken his little boy with him. During the trip he reminded the little chap, every now and then, that he must be on his very best behavior there in Chicago. He said, "'We shall be the guests of a clergyman. There will be other guests, clergymen and their wives and you must be careful to let those people see, by your walk and conversation, that you are of a godly household. Be very careful about this." The admonition bore fruit. At the first breakfast which they ate in the Chicago clergyman's house, he heard his little son say in the meekest and most reverent way to the lady opposite him, "'Please, won't you, for Christ's sake, pass the butter?' Mark Twain. To be continued.